writing. As a participant of this company who's watching, and also as a mental health professional, I cannot tell you how exciting this is uh, to be here as a mental health professional. Um, uh, and what actually stood out was the, um, the bar graph that talked about the anxiety uh, and uh, how these uh, psychedelic drugs are actually helping. Uh, my mainstay work is with anxiety and depression as well, so this is really exciting. So uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to um, start with asking some questions that I want to ask as a mental health professional, and then maybe we open it up to questions. I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions, don't you? Yes. I hope so. Okay. So I'm not. I'm going to try not to bore you with uh, uh, a lot of talk, but I, I think mental health is interesting, and all of us at some level have uh, questions, right? We felt anxiety and we felt depression, and we we've had. Um, uh, times where we felt if there was something that could magically make uh, some of these feelings go away, make the anxiety go away. And it's almost feeling like, um, you know, uh, we may have some of these substances may have the power to help us out. Is that fair to say? I think it's fair to say that they have the promise to help us. Um, I don't think we can fix what we've done to our environment and use us as a magic portion to override what we do as a species to the planet or to the world. I don't think that will get erased. And unless we look at that, we will continue to have challenges of more and more people requiring um, mental health support, partly because one knows that there's an emerging burgeon in crisis. I mean, we are 8 billion people on this planet and we may not be leaving it in a better state than, you know, I mean, we're certainly not making it easier for any other species we cohabit the planet with and, and certainly haven't made it easy for our own species either. No, absolutely not. So I, I, I worry about uh, this, the tendency to look at anything as a magic potion or a magic solution because it isn't. But yes, absolutely. I think the holy grail for any neurobiologist has always been consciousness. And it's one of the hardest things to study. And here you have... Um, way to probe questions about consciousness in humans and I think that that allows for the possibility of understanding many things which many people as species I think these are central and important questions well worth asking. Yeah. So I would say yeah I think promise but I worry about the word magic so I would remove that from because I think it's the worry I have is it erases responsibility and I think that component is so critical as well, in yeah, terms of and and thank God for that. Otherwise, I would be out of a job. <laughs> no, so uh, I absolutely agree that um, um, that they can be assisting in allowing us to uh, do work that hasn't been possible. Yeah. So, in fact, that's my next question because um, uh, how do, would you visualize the entry of these serotonergic psychedelics in therapy? So, for example, if we were to use therapy and help with integration, mm -hmm. but how would some of these drugs actually work? So, um, you know, there are lots of serotonergic psychedelics and there isn't one answer that applies across the board to all of them. Um, I think where we are at is trying to begin to understand from clinical trials how effective they are for which population. And obviously, history matters. For example, they do evoke... Uh, uh, altered states of perception and hallucinations. So someone with a potential genetic background that uh, carries risk for psychosis or for schizophrenia would be contraindicated for usage with these molecules because it's similar to what potentially can happen in terms of a psychotic break. So I think we're at the early steps where we still have to figure out how we will use microdosing, low dosing, which molecules, in which condition, Usually what has happened is in clinical trials, people have entered with a prior history of usage of other pharmacotherapy and 30% of pharmacological patients don't, who have major depression don't respond to any Absolutely. available, yeah, we've seen uh, that. any available antidepressant. So you have, you have one third of the population that is potentially not responding to anything available. So I think the, the, there is, there is going to be no doubt eventually psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and um, psychedelic assisted um, psychiatric care which will emerge but I think we have to navigate this cautiously and with an understanding some of these molecules so here's what I would say 
we have people who will eat like organic bread and be super careful about where they get whatever from and you know they're like I, I will not touch anything that is a pesticide that has ever seen one of my whatever my plants or my spinach can never have seen a pesticide and yet there will be recreational use of a mixed cocktail of moieties where you have no idea what is in that mixed cocktail at all right and i'm thinking many of these drugs are surely potent some of them are potent enough to cause structural changes in the brain that might last a long time um a small fraction of people develop something called hppd which is in the absence of exposure you can have a full fledged hallucinatory perceptual flashback without the drug being on board so i think the potency of these molecules is such that it they do command profound respect yeah. and i think as a consequence we have to figure out how we want to navigate this collectively from a legislative space from a space of humanitarian concern because absolutely there there is there is no doubt that the, these molecules responsibly used in the right circumstances have potent power and should be considered but we are in that scary zone where we can either go from laissez faire to hard legislation with a very difficult ability to figure out how to navigate this balance and the word actually that's coming to my mind is responsible mm -hmm. right i mean the reason it's been um, because the way drugs are available today and they are causing absolute havoc especially with the younger generation so what you're saying is that that irresponsible use is what's causing some of i mean these molecules are emerging as potential treatments for substance abuse yeah so yeah, that's they, another I think space Marte yeah, 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 yeah so yeah so there's this is an emerging area that these molecules will also be interesting for and and substance abuse is again a growing um, growing um, situation yeah so could you tell us a little bit more about that i believe that it's helped a lot with uh, like heroin addiction yeah it so drugs of abuse most drugs of abuse hijack your reward pathways in the brain and reward pathways you need because you have to remember that food has to taste good and that's why you eat it if you otherwise you're not going to be motivated to go eat or motivated to do anything so the natural rewards are food sex social interaction etc these are the natural rewards what these drugs like heroin cocaine nicotine alcohol do is they hijack that pathway and if they hijack it sufficiently it gets to the point where the drug provides the high and you do not get it from any natural reward that's when the circuit is completely being hijacked psychedelics interestingly don't seem to target that pathway so while they are schedule 1 compounds they are unlike many of the other schedule 1 compounds in that they do not have potent addictive properties they may have other potent effects which you worry about but they don't have appear not addictive they're not potently addictive at all because they don't seem to be targeting that particular pathway at all in fact they help individuals by allowing for a certain set of plastic changes that allow for the possibility of recovery and you know obviously relapses are the big worry that is less well studied but the possibility of reducing dependence is something that is emerging and so i mean i also want to ask you how does alcohol respond differently than these drugs So alcohol is a depressant. Okay. The best way to think about it is first you lose your ability to sound sensible. Then you lose your ability to walk a straight line. Then you lose your ability to do many other things and eventually lose multiple bodily functions and hopefully you're never getting that far. But um yeah, it's a potent depressant. Mm, caffeine is a stimulant for example. These drugs actually increase activity so molecules like lsd and psilocybin increase cortical activity uh, alcohol would do the opposite and um, actually it's very interesting someone generated this harm to humans chart where you had a chart of all the drugs that are used and the harm to human beings not just to yourself but also to other people and right at the top of that list is actually alcohol wow yep because much the, more than these drugs yep, but you have a big uh, big industry that will push it so you uh, in terms of you know the reality is that actually as a molecule driving under influence has caused way more deaths than one realizes alcohol will also cause a lot of um, you know lack of control so associated with aggressive attacks domestic violence so it is a potent molecule but it's one that's legally sanctioned so we have as a species we have a complicated relationship with how we view molecules and what we choose to view as something we should study not study what is culturally allowed not allowed you know so, so what i'm hearing is at a minimum at least research needs to start so i would say that absolutely you should allow for research i think we it's um, you know unless you have 
effective understanding of molecules that are these, these potent people will use them without an understanding and that's much more worrying and um, you need to understand how they work what they work for what you need to be careful about for example some of these molecules have cardiac effects mm -hmm. and so a side effect of mdma would be a cardiac event so this is something that people need to know and you know sometimes these drugs end up in the street where that awareness is not there and then you have a situation that can arise without just because that information is not available um i'm just going to ask a couple of questions and then i'm going to open it up uh, I wanted to ask, what is, you know, you talked about the shaman, shaman um, uh, and uh, indigenous um, practitioners, right? So, I mean, what is interesting is what can we learn from the wisdom and the knowledge of them, uh, the shamans, that would be helpful to use? As a um, society, we have lost reverence, right? So, I mean, and I don't mean reverence in the, always the traditional sense of a religious understanding of reverence. But reverence for for value systems that center compassion, that center generosity, that center um, a, a hum humanistic approach, we are losing that. And when you lose reverence for each other and for those who co inhabit spaces with you, you also lose reverence for things that you are using. And I think that extends. You lose reverence for water and trees and spaces, and you lose reverence. And I think that there's something to be learned from the shamans it would be a reverential understanding of how we can coexist with other species and other beings that you know go inhabit this planet with us we are a recent experiment in evolution a very recent experiment in evolution but we have caused we have changed you know the anthropocene is what we are doing to our environment is really changing it we are responsible single-handedly for the extinction of several species so I think there's something to be learned. It would be, the word I would use is reverence, and I don't mean it in a religious sense. I mean it in a deep sense of asking, if we are temporary res residents on this planet, how will we choose to navigate that? Absolutely, and that's the word, and that's what I'm taking away from the presentation as well, that uh, as potent as these, as these substances are, I think we need to show the kind of respect the shamans used and some of these indigenous practitioners used. Uh, and they used it with a lot of sensitivity and understanding yeah. and respected nature yeah. while they did that and not abused it. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I think back in terms of the fact that like 500 years back, people will look at our era and judge us. And if we apply that lens, it might be really interesting to see what in the last 100 years we have done or what we are choosing to do. And if you look at that event of letting the nuclear bomb go, yeah. And banning this, then it's an interesting event, right? You, you talked about think the government and all as well, but that's a topic for another. It's, it's yeah. the war machine. I mean, there is a big industrial war machine, and there is a big business interest. So you are not going to be able to take away an idea of nationhood easily. But if you think about it, it's an artificial line, it's drawn in the sand temporarily and shifting. And and some of these substances have the ability to actually make us forget those. So that's not very good for the government. It's certainly not very good for anyone who'd like to retain control. Yeah. But then taking all of this into account, Manu, I, I promise you it's my last question, is what do you think the future of psychedelics will look like for us? So, you know, I think that when you do have careful and sensible approaches and it enters spaces um, where it is used in a sensible manner, in a, in a controlled manner, I think that it can give profound insights to humanity about the way we perceive ourselves on this planet. And I think that that is one of the biggest challenges actually to why it will not be accessed easily because it will allow central questions of why you would allow, if you were to put up a slide of the number of people who have died and been considered heroes for war, we have sanctioned war. We have sanctioned violence. We have sanctioned the harming of our own species and other species. If once you allow for the opening of questions that centrally asks, is this how we want to navigate our time on this planet? It's a threat. It's a threat to existing political structures, existing ways of being. It's too scary. So it's easier to keep it under very tight control. And that is actually, in my sense, I think that is the bigger one. That that um, totalitarian regimes, which are emerging world over, and we see them everywhere, are a desire to control. And a desire to control 
dissent, a desire to control the ability to navigate choice and to have a you know difference of opinion with respect. Um, that's disappearing. And I think these molecules are interesting because they allow you to not see yourself in a in a different manner from another individual where you feel the need to cause harm. Right. If you see continuity and you see no massive difference, but political structures require you to view someone as the other. Otherwise, political structures fall apart in the way currently the world is navigating itself. If you do not have another, you do not, you will start questioning the political structure. Right? You open up the possibility that you will ask if you are independently elected democratic governments, what are you doing for the people? It is easier to divert that attention to another. And othering of human beings has been the approach of political leadership across the world time. for a long time. Which is why this is such a breakthrough. Which is why area. it's going to be interesting yeah. to see how we yeah. navigate this field. And I'm really excited for one, especially what this means for, like you said, psychedelic assisted therapy. Uh, what well, it the means wind will come therapy. from therapy, but I, yes. I hope it opens up the possibility Much. of dialogue of a different kind. I think we're a long way away from that. We're still now opening up to research. Yeah. But yeah. hopefully in hopefully my life, in India, one will not have to spend five years to get one, yeah. this thing to do one experiment. Yeah. Because it can be, I think, absolutely path breaking. Yeah. I mean, yes. this, this is an exciting space for anyone interested in the brain. It's interesting for cultural anthropologists. It's interesting for psychiatrists and psychotherapists. Yeah. It's interesting for neurobiologists. interesting for young people who are going to see themselves entering the world. Politically, it's interesting. It's interesting for many reasons. Yeah, and there's a lot of work happening in the West. So we are very excited here <laughs> for some of this to come soon. And I think that's the critical part that we have to have our local understanding. We can't just no. copy paste uh, an idea at all because there is no local understanding. And set setting and cultural context matter hugely for these molecules. Thank you so much. I'm going to open it up to questions. I see one person there. Just could you answer once you have the mic? Please go ahead. I have a couple of questions actually. I hope I, I can ask both. So, what's the relationship between mescaline and mescal, which is an alcohol? Uh, yeah, as far as I know, none. I mean, there's no mescaline and mescal. I think mescaline is just the molecule in uh, in peyote cactus. Yeah, but it might have it might have similar roots and meanings in terms of language. Uh, mescal might have been used it has a specific meaning. I think in Spanish. I'm not sure, but yeah. Uh, Both are made from cactus, yeah, which is why yeah, I was thinking. Yeah. I don't think there's any mescaline in India. Yeah. So the second question, uh, can I ask this or somebody else? Um, I see your hand up. So there was, I think, there was another hand? show of hand. Yeah, so we'll we'll come back to you. I mean, that's okay. I have like four or five <laughs> questions I want to ask. <laughs> we'll just pretend there are auditory hallucinations <laughs> emerging from different parts of the room. Um, so the first one was, um, you mentioned how serotonin is a neurotransmitter, mm -hmm. uh, but um, that's only like 5% of the serotonin in the whole body because that's in the brain, but 95% uh, is in your gut and it's not even made by your brain, it's made by your uh, gut bacteria. So I was going to ask that, but another point you uh, came up with, which was very interesting was about the mitochondria. And um, I mean, if we go back on the evolutionary timeline, then mitochondria is a bacteria in our cell. So um, what do you think about uh, this relationship that the bacteria have with serotonin and all these different chemicals in the body? Because there are so many neurotransmitters and I mean, they make 500 or 1000 genes in your body and we make 200 or so. Yeah, yeah, great question. I mean, most of your body is actually bacterial cells floating around in it. Um, yes, there's much more serotonin in your gut than there is in your brain. And serotonin has been around for 3 billion years and the nervous system has been only around for like some 700 million years. So in terms of the fact that this molecule existed long before there were any organisms that had anything that resembled a brain, uh, the evolutionary history of serotonin is super old. Um, there's actually an interesting hypothesis on this from Ephraim Azmitya where he talks about the the first emergence of life on the planet and the very first emergence of life would have required you to trap energy to use that to generate food. And so you have photosynthetic machinery. And 
eventually you have to burn the energy that you have. So you use that energy and you burn it. And so you have to set up something that will potentially combust and use that energy. And so that's your bacteria in a sense that got en engulfed as endosymbionts into multicellular cells. But when you do all that and you use all this energy and you're, you know, making, you're using light and you're using and generating energy eventually, you're also producing a bunch of things you don't want, which is free radicals. And when you have free radicals, those free radicals can damage membranes, they can damage other, other proteins, they can cause damage and then can actually endanger the cell in its entirety. So you have to co-evolve a way to fix all those toxic molecules that are being made. And one hypothesis is that serotonin may have been an antioxidant that that's what its original use might have been in sort of really ancient historic organisms that's a debate but certainly there's evidence from plants which have tons more there's more serotonin in a banana than there is in in your brain you know there's a lot of serotonin in a banana you can't consume it it'll be digested in your in your gut by by the monoamine oxidase but there is a lot of serotonin in a banana so what people have shown is that if you take leaves and you cut them, they brown, right? You, you know what would happen. And if you apply serotonin, you actually prevent the browning of leaves. So there is there is these old growth slash antioxidant-like effects that were attributed to serotonin. Lots of serotonin precursors are definitely made by bacteria on your gut. And so quality of the bacteria, your microbiome is going to impact serotonergic production in your gut and your enteric nervous system and a lot of that is not necessarily going to get into your brain it's going to be doing snuff in your body i mean there's serotonin receptors everywhere what we don't know is whether serotonin influences mitochondria and other cells what we found was an effect on cortical cells in fact cortical neurons and not even hippocampal neurons didn't find an effect on muscle cells so we don't know about gut yet that is something we are exploring and we'd be very interested in looking at that because that's where this it's chock-a-block full of cells okay. but all great questions and your gut is a huge component of what will regulate cell tone okay can we i think there's one question here then we'll come back to you yeah Thank you. First of all, I want to say it's super interesting. Um, and I had a related mitochondria question, so maybe it's a good time to ask it. Um, what is the persistence of the effect mm -hmm. of uh, DOI on mitochondria? Is it just for the duration of the trip or is it even after, for how long after? It's a great question. I'm looking at Sashana saying this is something we need to be able to answer more effectively. So we know that um, serotonin itself will if, and DOI, so both serotonin and DOI do it. So it's not just the psychedelic. Serotonin will also do it. Other drugs that hit the same receptor but are not psychedelics also give us effects on mitochondria. Those effects are fast. They come in within two hours of exposure to these compounds. I mean, the DOI gives you increases in mitochondrial DNA within like literally two to four hours. We know that if we chronically bathe the system for days, we continue to see the effects. We also know that when you chronically bathe the system for days, the effects which are associated with hallucinations wane off because the, the system downregulates those particular responses quite steeply. A week out, we know that if we've given a week of treatment, it's certainly seen out uh, till a week. What we've not done is the question you're asking is, which is if we withdraw and watch later, how long will this last out? Don't know. What we do know is that if we perturb serotonin levels in the baby brain, we end up actually reducing mitochondria across the lifespan out to six months despite the increase of serotonin being for a short window in the developmental window. If we do it in an adolescent brain, we end up increasing mitochondria and mitochondrial function that lasts six months after we ever increased serotonin. So those effects are very long lasting. If we do it in adulthood, it's short lived. So the timing seems to matter hugely. And this is why these molecules are so interesting. Age matters. You go in too early, serotonin actually increases anxiety increases despair-like behavior in the early developmental window and in the adolescent window it switches to actually reducing anxiety-like behavior and reducing despair-like behavior. So timing is absolutely critical. But yeah, the answer is that it's going to matter on when and for how long and we haven't done the exact experiment that you're asking which is something we should just do. Yeah, we should just do. We will do it. 
I have a question that segues from what she said. So it's all connected in one regard. Yeah. First of all, thanks for sharing this reality with us. It's uh, great to gather all this knowledge. Um, you mentioned formative years. I don't know how much of this translates from the models that you all are studying to, let's say, a human or primate model. Uh, if you can just touch upon the formative years and how it plays a role. Yeah. And secondly, you know, introduction of these molecules, you mentioned uh, the timing being very critical. Mm -hmm. How, um, what's the progression that you've seen uh, with introduction of these molecules, whether they are psychedelics, which are non-addictive versus, you know, addictive compounds that you also uh, had on the industry? Okay. So let me answer the first one, the, the question about um, critical periods and windows in early life. Um, we are, when I say early life in a rodent, I'm talking about two days after birth to like three weeks. By three weeks, they're largely independent of the dam and are pretty much capable to, you know, eat and look after them. I mean, they're already moving very early, but they can be fairly independent by three weeks. About four weeks on till about um, six weeks is adolescence. And eight weeks onwards is considered young adult in a, in a rodent. The lifespan is about two and a half years. So this is what we're talking about. We would love to be able to do a nice extrapolation. Nobody can. Uh, we can't tell you what the exact critical period is for primates or the exact critical. And critical periods vary for different things. So, for example, for language development, we know from humans what the critical periods are. So, the, the, certainly for effective bilinguality, it needs to be early. Otherwise, you're translating in your brain. And we do know that from work done in humans. Uh, obviously, for visual development, we also know this in humans, we know this in primates, that there are critical periods in which, for example, this is work from Hubel and Wiesel that got them the Nobel Prize many, many decades ago, where if you shut the eye during development, even though the retina is totally intact, you will go blind from that eye because your brain gives up territory to the other eye. Because it's not receiving input from this eye during development, it views this as a useless structure. So your retina is absolutely okay but you lose the territory in the brain. The brain just gives it to the other eye. Unless you open the eye within the critical period and then it comes right back. If you open it after the critical period, you are functionally blind. And how did this matter? This mattered because babies born with cataracts, they didn't used to do surgeries in babies because they thought it was not a good idea to do such an invasive surgery so early. But then they realized if we don't clean up the cataract, we're actually functionally making that individual blind in that eye eventually because getting it out fast is actually critical. Um, also to correcting the squint is critical early, right? So this, because obviously your territory in your brain is using what you see to map things. So what you see allows territory in the brain to be dedicated to one eye versus the other, etc. Also for depth perception. So that's to say that we can't quickly extrapolate. What's the human data? The human data actually comes from evidence that SSRIs like Prozac used in children now carry, uh, I mean, they are still legally allowed. It is often the drug of choice, but it carries a black box warning that it increases risk for suicidality and suicidal ideation in, in children and adolescents because this is a contraindication that showed up Initially, the data was all compiled. So if you compile everybody, you don't see it. But when you break it by decade or you break it by age group, you can see this data emerge. And that was also a patient support group that pushed to actually get that data released. And the reality is that that we do see this in rodents, that if you give SSRIs like Prozac early, you actually program anxiety and despair. If you give them in adolescence, you reduce anxiety and despair. And if you give them in adulthood, you get the effects while the drug is on board. Once the drug is withdrawn, it goes back to baseline. But when you do it in the early windows, the effects last for, we know, out till 18 months we have effects. And there's no drug on board. The drug was just used for three weeks in a short developmental window. Effects are lifelong. So in a two and a half year cycle, we have done three weeks of treatment when they were P2 to P21. So 18 days around in the early window. Out till 18 months, we can see behavioral effects as a consequence of that short-lived exposure because it's timing. It's a developing brain. And the developing brain is not just a miniaturized adult. It's, it's a very plastic brain that's undergoing major change. And pharmacological shift in that window can have very long-lasting consequences. On the second question, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. Do you mean in terms of when, when do you see clinical usage of these molecules emerging? or? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, regulation methods are very important. So I'm 
would be interested to know like <laughs> what yeah. would be the you know i i mean you're asking the the difficult the question i mean the united states for example which has taken the lead is not even one country so i mean you are going to see a number of different things happening in different states you will have bans in some places you will i mean it's not one country in the way it approaches this i don't think we should look necessarily to the west for our own eventual legislative approach within india i think we need to evolve appropriate local practices for which we need clinical trials in the indian context because you have to also imagine how you are potentially going to take this to someone who may be illiterate rural and have major treatment resistant depression how are you going to explain the usage of these what is the in local context and what is the local system in which you will apply these treatments because that's where the large or we're still a rural country in many ways while this is an urban population we are very rural and we i mean there's a emerging large burden of mental health disorders across the country for different stratified sections of society and how are you going to navigate this and how does one so one has to really debate think about it and i just think that we need clinical trials coming out of places like nimhans where we have an indian understanding of how this works in our context Yeah, have a question for him, and I don't know how are we on time. Are we okay? okay. So uh, all the discussion has been on using psychedelics, psychedelics to solve problems. What about psychedelics to enhance cap capabilities? <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, I don't think there's any scientific evidence currently to indicate that psychedelics enhance capabilities. Uh, for example in that case nicotine is known for example to drive up uh, attention and performance caffeine will drive up attention but of course these drugs often have inverted use in that where there's a point at which if you are uh, consume large amounts of red bull you probably just tremoring all over the place and not being effective at all i mean you've gone off the chart right so yes molecules will influence attention will influence behavior the the big worry with molecules like psychedelics is because they alter perception and reality and you do not know the underlying genetic background on which they are working that that cocktail and that combination how it will work is always an open question a little bit of an open question which is why the controlled circumstance under you know under observation low dose etc etc that is such a critical component of therapy itself people have debated the use of these molecules from that perspective but i don't think there's solid scientific evidence in any case to suggest that what often happens is do more creative people likely expose themselves to this is the question which is the so just reverse it you can say that is it just that you have had many more creative minds uh, open to the possibility of exploring the use rather than whether exploration has led to more creativity so this is a it's, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem question back there was um so i had one related to depression and one uh, on what he asked um so i in fact feel like um, the use of psychedelics can enhance uh, capabilities because one of the things you said with nicotine mm -hmm. it's uh, more about you know the difference between attention and awareness how like meditation gets you to be aware which is much more important than just having that focused attention uh but so there's this stone dape theory about how we used uh, psychedelics to uh, change our consciousness yeah. Yeah. and uh, a lot of people in the western world microdose a lot to enhance their capabilities and you yourself said uh, reality is nothing but a potent mix of probably psychedelics in your head i'm paraphrasing here heavily okay. but <laughs> that's an interesting paraphrase i'm not sure i said exactly that but yes but so, so, so i said uh, reality is an agreed upon collective agreement of what we have decided is reality it's an agreed hallucination it's an it's an i well it, yeah i mean then 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 we have entered very existential questions about what exists and what does not right i mean in in principle it is an agreement between you and me that we are in this room and x number of people are sitting here and we have not imagined five people sitting yeah, there yeah. right we've agreed collectively you and me that there are not five people sitting here So, so my but question, to someone else, they might be, and that is a yeah. truly possible reality for them. Yeah, I, I mean, um, there's machine elves and all those things yes. people see on uh, exactly. Amitabh trip to me. Yes, with yes, DMT. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, my question was basically, so um, what most people believe that psychedelics do is they increase the bandwidth of information that you're taking, like yeah, entropy. Yeah. So, 
maybe if like we have sustained use in a very responsible manner over time do you think that is going to change human consciousness to the level where uh, we use this as a tool for our evolutionary development and mentally more than anything else hmm tough question oh my god um i so i so one of the things i worry about is bringing the evolutionary argument with us being at the pinnacle of any evolutionary ladder right i mean i would much rather imagine we are some side branch which has got one little tiny experiment on a side branch which by the way is nowhere nearly as successful as insects or as you know bacteria or multiple other so we are some one side branch so i worry about the idea of this uh, idea of evolving into a supreme version of oneself right that this this is a the problematic human idea that we have and it's not one which is which is really i mean what does evolving to the best version of yourself even fundamentally mean because it can you and i can disagree on what is the best version and everyone can have their own version of what they believe is the best version so i feel like these molecules would allow us to access um seeing the self as not such a critical domain and that dissolution of self element of of psychedelics is probably the most potent aspect of psychedelics because it then allows you to detach and perceive circumstance perceive the world perceive your influence on environment quite differently i think that might have much more potent effects collectively for humanity than from any version which i and this is why i worry about the west doing this because there's always this i will make it better than you and then i will make it better than the third person i'll make it better than everybody else i'm not sure the productivity game has taken us to necessarily the best place on the planet because everything can keep producing more and more and more there's just we just be in a we are already in a malthusian crisis where does this go then right where does so i worry about it from arguments where it is used as an argument to produce the best version of ourselves because that argument of what that version is is what i'm questioning so i would worry about that i think the other is much more interesting which is dissolution of self dissolution of ego and what that potentially opens up for compassionate spaces for how one wants to live on this planet and i think that is much more interesting and i hope that that is the path i don't necessarily think it will be the path but i hope that is the path that eventually opens with these molecules i came across would be a myth maybe you could bust it if it's not true um that administering lsd allows two different departments or sections of the brain to communicate with each other that otherwise would not and uh, new connections form between them which encourages divergent thinking and stuff like is this myth so much as uh, perhaps maybe it's been simplified to describe it like that um for example um synesthetes would experience uh, that auditory hallucination we had could have also been like you know uh, could have been like flowers in the air visual something it's as you seeing things with multiple imagery or multiple representation so that suggests that there are underlying connections that are not always utilized unless they are unmasked and this we know from from classical exper- experiments that people have done where if you f- take away one input then other inputs emerge because the dominant input is out so then you can see other connections that emerge that are functionally available so there is a view that under the influence of psychedelics you will have much more network activity and that certainly triggered major network activity in primates and also in rodents and network activity goes up which allows for the unmasking of multiple existing connections it's just that they emerge under the influence whereas they would not be as available under standard so that's perhaps but they do also change plus they also change architecture of neurons so synapses are dynamically added and removed under the effects of psychedelics Hi. <clears throat> Hello. Can you talk a little bit about the interdisciplinary research, the possibilities of those uh, research avenues between eastern cultural traditions and psychedelic therapy? Gosh, I love that question. Thank because you. Because I because think they, because I, it's yes. all about non-dual awareness, yeah, yeah, about Advaita think, Vedanta. Yeah, absolutely, because I think I mean conceptually the idea of um, 
of non-self or or actually a dissolution of self and seeing oneself as not separate from the universe at all is central to not just multiple religions and spiritual experiences from the east but has also emerged in ideas all across the world at multiple times over and over again which is to see oneself as a continuum eventually and that is certainly one of the experiences that these molecules evoke what i find fascinating is they tap into circuits in your brain that allow you to experience yourself as not separate from the universe which means that the circuits lie there in and off of themselves this is a pharmacological access that opens that possibility but that also tells you do not need the pharmacology to access it and that i find particularly interesting it's the harder path it's probably the path that requires substantial more work but it tells you that there is the possibility of circuitry in the brain that allows for those same experiences in the absence of the pharmacological aid and i believe that that is probably what intends a uh, meditation for decades and decades of practice probably allows for the tapping into which is also happening under the influence of the psychedelic except the psychedelics not going to necessarily allow you to determine the direction of the, the trip right it is going to, you are just going to be on for the ride whereas i think and this is i mean this is this is really interesting and it opens up lots of questions of what those circuits are in the brain where they reside but these are windows into the possibility that those circuits obviously exist if pharmacology can do it then in the absence of pharmacology also one should be able to access it and i think that is really really intriguing and interesting i think it's the harder part but it's the one that requires the work i think it may also be a more sustainable longer term path it's but you know i think there is the value for therapy but there's also the value for exploring these possibilities and i think that it's opened up the possibility for that kind of dialogue consciousness was the holy grail but at the same time everybody didn't want to touch it because they were worrying about it going into you know strange spaces and not being able to really talk about it in any scientific parlance what psychedelics have done is opened up dialogue for possibilities with all kinds of disciplines that we find this interesting and so i think there is room for that i think really room for much deeper understanding and to look at how indigenous practices in that have emerged in so many different civilizations in so many spiritual practices removing the religious element or the control element but a willingness to actually learn from people who have practiced that for centuries sometimes passed down generations is well worth doing and i think scientists should not be averse to exploring those spaces Uh, thanks for asking that question. I think it's it is a really interesting one because it tells you that the the circuits are there in the brain. Um. So you spoke about how humans have DMT in their bodies and how that can lead to hallucinations or how that kind of leads to an agreed perception of reality. So do you see signs of those that DMT or other substances in rats and mice as well? And how does that extrapolate to experiments that you conduct on the effects of psychedelics on hallucinations in rat and mice models? So DMT is in plants, DMT is in rats, DMT is in mice, DMT is in all, all multiple species, DMT is in you, me, all of us. We all have it. So, I mean, we're all contraband. It's, it's, it's actually a really interesting question. You can't cross national boundaries with it and yet it's in your body and you're flying all over the world, right? So, yes, it's there. but it's largely not there at sufficiently high enough concentrations in your brain most of it gets broken down in your gut it gets broken down by an enzyme in your gut but you can block it from being broken down you can also inject it which will then allow it to access the brain without going through the the gut so that it's easier so that's how it was originally first tested and then it was an injection that allowed someone to realize that dmt is such a potent psychedelic we can't use dmt in any of our experiments in our lab it's a schedule 1 drug so we can't import it into india even though nida would send it to us for research purposes we can't because it's schedule 1 and we need a narcotics clearance to get it in so we use non schedule 1 compounds which are also serotonergic psychedelics so we can't um it is actually because of the schedule 1 ban lots of research world over slowed down india it slowed down drastically because it's really hard to work to get these compounds in we it took us 5 years to get psilocybin that too into a lab in nimhans because nimhans is the clinical license it took four of us working over 5 years to get one experiment done with psilocybin we finally did it literally last month 
and it's taken us five years to get there to be able to do that. It's easier to send the graduate students to the US to do the experiment and get the data than it is to get the uh, compound and, and use it for our experiments. So, yeah, can we just have like one question each? Uh, the last two slides you spoke about, unfortunately, I didn't understand it too well. I please pass them. I was trying to avoid getting into data. Yes. So, so you spoke about you know some psychedelic or something affecting the mitochondria and thereby enhancing the effectiveness of the brain. Or was that it? I was, uh, I did not no, no, you, so yes, you're right in the first part, which is I showed you data that DOI increases mitochondria. I didn't show you data that TCB2 and N-bomb also through other psychedelics also increase mitochondria. So you're driving up mitochondrial production. You're also driving up the manner in which mitochondria can produce energy. So you're enhancing their efficiency. What this matters for, I, I just blew past. So I'll tell you what it matters for. Neurons are fragile. And you can kill them quite easily. Yeah, you can kill them with like free radicals. So we use bleach. Like H two O two is a is is a you know is is nasty on all cells. Bleach will kill most cells and it will also kill neurons. So we use it at concentrations where we can kill the cells. And when we pre-treat the neurons with DOI, we can protect these neurons for a quite a dose range where they actually buffer the oxidative stress far better when they've been exposed to either serotonin or this particular serotonergic psychedelic. What that tells us is that your buffering capacity to handle a stress, a cellular stress in this context, is enhanced under the effects of both serotonin and serotonergic psychedelics. So it's neuroprotective. Is there anything available in this country that allows for this uh, protection? Now let's switch to something else we're working on. So, you know, We've been wondering how is it that in India, where we've been, we've used every psychoactive plant on the planet in this country. Okay, I mean, if you look at traditional uh, Ayurvedic literature, it is chock a block full of usage of a variety of plants. We have also found things that will kill, and that is that also is the problem is that you need to look at this with uh, without the desire for a vain glorious belief that we invented and discovered everything five thousand years ago with a real respect for the possibility that there might be really interesting things there as well. So when we started looking at some, some of these compounds, we, we looked at several of the standard ones. We found many things that didn't have any effect. But we're in the midst of publishing a paper with, with and I guess I can say it, how does it matter? It's, it's going to be out very quickly. Vidanya Somnifera, which is Ashwagandha, oh. extremely protective, highly neuroprotective, and... Um, very, very strongly regulates mitochondria and regulates, we know the pathway, we know how it works. Really interesting molecule, potently neuroprotective, not a serotonergic psychedelic at all. We know the active ingredient that mediates these effects, but it's one that's been used for long time in uh, indigenous practices in, in Ayurveda. People take ashwagandha as a rasayana, they take it as an anxiolytic. It has been reported to be used as an antidepressant. And has very interesting effects in mouse neurons, in rat neurons, in rats, and on the brain. So it is highly protective. So we have interesting molecules, which might, and we've also looked at other molecules which did nothing. I mean, we have looked at our, plenty of other plants, Brahmi being one, Centella asiatica didn't give us these effects. It gives us other effects, but not these. And lots of other people have reported interesting effects. Those matters you know, the dose matters. And so that becomes a big problem because what you give to a rat or even to a neuron and what a human being needs to take, that extrapolation is a big, bit of a leap. You can't just make a kilogram estimation and, you know, extrapolate. But at least preliminary preclinical data strongly indicate that it's neuroprotective. And the empirical data that is the fact that it's been used for thousands of years certainly tells you it's not toxic. But how effective is it? Unless you do the clinical work, you don't necessarily find out. But there will be molecules of that nature that are, are strong. I mean, most pharmacological substances we use today, originally, many of them have emerged from, from plants. Paxol being one great example. So there are many, many compounds that have emerged from plants. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are many more. 
there are also toxic compounds in plants and that's the scary part right that you don't you know don't know the cocktail and you don't know what concentrate you also don't know where it was synthesized so yeah a little bit scary on that front sure thanks so much should we take the uh, take the one last question for the evening ask anuradha how we're doing and okay. yeah one last question yeah so i guess we could do two questions right um so the last uh, question was about um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor so what do you think they do differently from uh, other psychedelics because it's interesting in the sense that uh, ssris just allow your body to reuptake the same thing again and um, these entheogens they bring their own uh, serotonin into the system and they lock into the 5ht2a receptor and turn the key in another way or whatever but what do you think they do differently and why do some ssris increase the risk for anxiety and depression while these completely reduce anxiety yeah yeah, yeah i know like yeah. i mean yeah. you no, talk... no that's a great question so most uh, ssris will in an acute sense actually drive up anxiety and so one of the reasons why you get poor compliance in that initial period is because first of all you don't get the therapeutic benefit for a long time in the hope that an eventual therapeutic effect will emerge within weeks you need compliance across that period of time and then you also have an acute effect which could be anxiogenic where you increase anxiety and that's because these molecules so here's the thing right you want the effects on specific receptors in specific circuits which are beneficial but you can't control the effects on all the other receptors that are also in many other circuits at the same time so one of the effects is on 5HT2A and 2C in 2 on especially on 5HT2C in the amygdala which drives up a strong anxiety like response that happens with serotonin it will happen also with a serotonin 2C agonist because of that until you down regulate that response you're not going to pull off the other responses you want so there's it's like to get to that final destination you will have to go through this rockiness of of things that you know you'll you'll hit off target where you don't want to hit part of the problem is you're in um you know you're just increasing the endogenous levels available of serotonin you can't control which receptor it's going to work on it's going to work on all available receptors you also don't know the substrate of receptors in every individual because life experience changes receptor composition levels function etc so this is the tricky part so it's a bit of a it's guesswork more often than not for the psychiatrist to figure out which is going to be the appropriate drug whether it will work and then the patients to wait for 3 to 6 weeks to see if it has an effect and then if it does and then compliance to ensure that the patient hangs in long enough now if someone is suicidal this is too long a wait and this is where the worry is with compounds that take so much longer uh, molecules like ketamine and the psychedelics have rapid effects so we know that the mood effects in principle can be very quick and so that timeline is very different with an ssri and with molecules like ketamine and more often than not people use them in combination where ketamine is used to get the initial effect and then you hold on with with an ssri or an nari so it's combination therapy obviously individuals or electroconvulsive seizure therapy which still does get used in very very treatment resistant individuals not responding to anything so we don't know enough to be able to control the target circuits one of our interests is also to under, understand specifically which circuit contributes to which particular behavioral effect it's not always the same circuit they individual distributed discrete circuits so this is a question probably for the both of you uh, what about the use you know scientists or uh, you know mental health practitioners using psychedelics to understand the impact of psychedelics interesting question you are talking to someone who is a neuropsychopharmacologist who's petrified at the idea of you accessing pharmacology unnecessarily so my personal view would be i'll go down that path the question that came from there which is i'm fascinated by the idea that the circuits exist and that there's work to be done to access those circuits i'd like to do the work it's the rocky or longer longer path but i think it's the most sustainable one in the longer term so i'm not a fan of the idea of the lots of people who work with psychedelics who use them i certainly would not i have profound respect for them and i'm very interested in studying them 
but I would like to keep my cortical circuits not exposed. You know, I like the other idea, the idea that those circuits exist and in the absence of a pharmacological aid, one can also access them. And that requires work. And I think that work is worth well worth doing across the lifespan. So yeah, I prefer that part. I don't know how Priyanka wants to take. <laughs> but thank you so much, Vidita. It's been an um, absolute privilege to share this space. It has just been wonderful to have you here to, to, to chat about this with because I remember I work with rodents. So, so take everything I say with a bit of a pinch of salt. So. <laughs> So thank you, audience, for all your questions and for making this. Thanks, Thanks so everyone. Wonderful.